Ja. Damn it. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Are we good? <laughs> We're good. Great. All right. That's a good. That's a good sound, sound test. Um, yeah. There's a couple of more people coming in. All right. Well, welcome everybody to to Dunsink Observatory. Uh, lovely to see so many people here on a Monday night. Uh, my name is Peter Gallagher. I'm the director of the observatory, and uh, tonight is a festival of history event so we're going to focus on some of the notable history uh, that the observatory has been associated with over the years of course there are a few graduate students wandering around who know a bit of astronomy as well so if you want to talk to them about some astronomy or indeed myself uh, we're happy to talk about that but we're here tonight to talk about the Armagh Dunsink Harvard telescope which was a significant milestone uh, in Irish science really um, at a time when Irish science was really languishing and didn't really know where it was. And so I'm going to introduce uh, this topic with a, a few slides. And then I have some uh, experts in history and in astronomy as well who are going to join me in the stage, um, Mary Daly and uh, 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 Michael Burton. Uh, and we'll have a chat about what this meant for Ireland at the time. Uh, what it meant internationally and what kind of science uh, 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 the telescope also did. So it's a story that starts really um, with the astronomical observatories of, of Ireland. Uh, we have a long tradition of astronomy in Ireland going back to the 1780s and 1790s when Dunsink and Armagh were founded. And they were founded to do things like find the distances to the stars using the best telescopes that they could find at the time. In fact, this room was where all the observations were taken at Dunsink uh, Observatory. But times changed over, uh, over the periods that the, between the foundations of the observatory and the 1920s. And that was a real key moment for this institution um, because we were part of Trinity. And Trinity at the time found itself at sea in this new state. And uh, this observatory was basically closed down in 1921. Uh, there was no support for it. There was a royal astronomer who lived here um, w with their family, uh, but he didn't like the, the new political situation. And there was no funding for science, and so he left. And so Dunsink ended up isolated in this new sa state without a, a way to go as very much did Trinity College Dublin, uh, because partly because of pictures like that that was uh, so well known by people at the time and by our political establishment that were uh, about at the time. Um, this is what the observatory looked like. It hasn't actually changed really at all. It's still a lovely Georgian building, um, which was both a home, kind of a manor home, but also a working astronomical observatory. Um, you can see the dome on the top, which still works. It's exactly the same dome that was there then. Likewise with this room, you know, uh, the, the Meridian Room, where we also made observations. But between 1921, with the departure of the Astronomer Royal, then it was um, mothballed and it formally closed by Trinity in 1937. And so uh, it was actually rented out. We were just talking about it earlier. It was rented out to a doctor. And the doctor uh, lived here for about 10 years. Um, and then in comes a gentleman who is associated with the founding of this state, which was um, Eamon de Valera. Now, uh, some of you may know that Eamon de Valera was a, was a great fan of mathematics, of astronomy, of physics. Even when he was in prison, he wrote Hamilton's Quaternion Equations, which uh, the jailer, or the, 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 uh, the uh, they thought was code that, uh, that he, he was up to, but actually he was just interested in doing some mathematics. But Eamon de Valera wanted to establish a scientific establishment that kind of put Ireland back on the map for basic research. And it was just after the Second World War, and he was trying to put a stamp on Ireland, and he thought this was a way to do it. And there was a lot of Jewish scientists who were escaping from war-torn Europe. And uh, this is one of them here. This is Erwin Schrodinger, who he attracted. But he, he also attracted others. This is uh, Dirac over here, who was in Cambridge. But they were coming to Dublin. These were great names in the foundation of, of physics at that time. And he was able to attract them uh, to Ireland. Um, actually, there's Nolan. <laughs> we were talking about uh, Nolan er earlier on. 
um, and a nice smattering of uh, people with collars as well, uh, reflecting his other interests. Um, but this was 19, 1940, so what's that, 80, 82 years ago, uh, when DIAS was formed. And it was formed with a school of theoretical physics, um, a school of, um, of, 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 uh, of Celtic studies as well. But he then started thinking, I'd like to do something in astronomy. And he was always interested in this building. And he'd been interested in this building even when he was an undergraduate student, uh, working with a guy, his bust is over there, called Whitaker. And he used to come and get lectures from Whitaker uh, and love the place, despite the really difficult, different political views. In 1946, though, he happened to be in, uh, uh, in Shannon Airport, waiting for the arrival of some bishops from the United States who were on their way to Rome to become cardinals, right? And, uh, but there was another person on that plane, and that was this gentleman here on, on, on the left, uh, Harlow Shapley. Shapley. Harlow was the director of Harvard Observatory, and he was on his way to a conference in Denmark. And he recognized, I guess, uh, Eamon de Valera and came to talk to him and said, would you be interested in building a telescope? And I would think that Eamon de Valera immediately responded, yes, I would. Um, and Harlow Shapley's former student, who had been at Harvard, was now the director of Armagh. So it was there's this series of connections that were made uh, from this. Now remember, at this time, the Irish state, the Southern Irish state and the Northern Irish state weren't exactly cooperating very well. But this was a way that maybe they could cooperate in a way that avoided names, words like Catholic and Protestant and Unionist and Loyalist and Free State and all of those kind of words. Um, so letters were very quickly exchanged. This is from April of 1946. And this is a letter from Harlow Shapley uh, to the Lord Primate of all Ireland, uh, who was actually the chair of, um, of the Armagh Observatory. So, and still is, in fact. But it, it says here, I had the good fortune to discuss the astronomical work of the Dunsick Observatory with Prime Minister Eamon de Valera a few weeks ago, and I was passing Ireland on my way to Copenhagen. As Dr. Dr. Lindsay has no doubt told you, de Valera is interested in a revival of the activity of the observatory. So this was really a moment that not only gave them an idea for a telescope, but also the idea of getting Dunsink Observatory going again. Um, and you know the government then very quickly uh, purchased it. So the Office of Public Work Works now owns this building. Dias is, is, is leases it, and uh, it was bought then in 1947. And also they founded a new school within Dias called the School of Cosmic Physics. It's very funny to go back and read the conversations in the Doyle at the time, because one of the guys says, I uh, it described it as the school of comic physics, but then he decided that he'd misread it and accused de Valera of all kinds of things. I don't know how de Valera sat there listening to this just constant criticism of what he, it was like a whole room of Michael Healy Rays shouting at him about this. So I'm, not, I'm not a politician, clearly. Uh, but. Um, it's, 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 it's a re but he didn't listen and he pushed it through and founded Dias and then uh, found, founded this school of cosmic physics which included Dunsink. Immediately there was cooperation between Armagh and Dunsink. This is 1948. Uh, this is Herman Brook. Uh, he lived, he'd lived here and this is brought up his family here in this building. This is the, the South Dome outside. And this is Eric Lindsay and Eric Lindsay is key to this whole story. He was a master politician actually on top of being an astronomer and he was the one who navigated the northern government and the southern governments together in order to achieve so much. Um, and this is a comment actually um, uh, about that cooperation. Um, it was a time you know there was they were going to build a telescope, they were starting Dias, they were bringing back in the observatory and then there was this International Astronomical Union which is the big kind of United Nations for astronomy and Ireland was represented at this at a time where we weren't involved in very many international organizations. But you can see that Ireland was represented by Professor Brooke from Dunsink and uh, Dr. Butler from, uh, from Dunsink, but also Dr. Lindsay from, from Armagh. It's interesting that he was talking about uh, Ireland being represented from these entities, north, north and south. 
but many, many amateur astronomers are also present from Northern Ireland and, and ERA. And it is, it, the comment here is clear from the start that astronomy, both professional and amateur, uh, was truly an all-Ireland activity. And this was uh, actually from an article in 2007 by a lady called Mary Brooks. She was an astronomer, did her PhD here in Dunsink, and uh, was married to Herman Brook, uh, so, uh, and uh, there's a building in DCU named after her now. But it's fascinating to look at some of the letters then that were exchanged uh, between the governments. This one, you can see you know, the, the, the British seal in the center of it there, but it's all about the astronomy and talking about this agreement that they're going to have to build a telescope. Um, not just any telescope, this is going to be the biggest telescope in the Southern Hemisphere, and it's going to involve the North and the South and also the United States uh, in this agreement. But you can see that original letter uh, inside um, in one of the rooms. What's that coming from? Is that me? If I don't need it, I'll take it off. OK, well, we'll keep going. We'll see. Um, and this is a correspondence then coming from St. Stephen's Green um, and uh, uh, com coming from a P. Murphy. Um, but it's, it's interesting writing to, Dr. Or to Mr. McNeese, and Mr. McNeese was the solicitor for the Northern Irish government, and they're going back and forth having these uh, conversations, and that Harvard have to be involved in this agreement. And this is the agreement that was eventually signed. It wasn't between the two governments, actually. It ended up they couldn't sign that agreement. I don't know why. I, you, you, I don't know why. Maybe you'll explain that one. Um, but what they did do is they were able to have the government support for the agreement. And then Dias si signed it, um, Armagh signed it, and also Harvard signed it as well. And uh, you can see all of the signatures, and we're delighted that, um, where's Matthew? Is Matthew around? Oh, there he is. Matthew, Matthew McMahon there uh, brought this down from, from Armagh for us. So you can see that original uh, agreement inside, which is an amazing piece of paperwork uh, to see at that time. But there was north-south cooperation going on at this time. This is uh, Lindsay commenting on it. It was the present writer's task to bring about the cooperation of the two governments and return to Ireland in the spring. Negotiations were entered with the governments of Northern Ireland and the Republic, involving people like Major Sinclair and Eamon de Valera. There was no way they were fighting on the same <laughs> side 20 years, or 30, 20 years previous. And now they're making agreements uh, around astronomy. So that's all the historical context. And Mary will give us more about that in a second. But what did, what, what did they do this for? Why on earth did they want to build a telescope? Well, they wanted to go down to the southern skies because it has interesting astronomical objects down there that we can't see from this part of the world. Also, you can pick a site in Africa that doesn't have very many clouds. And Harvard had an observatory down in a place called Bloemfontein at Boyden Observatory. And so they had a site that Harvard had and they wanted to go down to these southern skies. And there's two big, particularly interesting blobs of stars called the Magellanic Clouds. And they were going to go and study those. Lots of interesting objects in there. But they needed a telescope that was going to be able to allow them to do those studies. And the telescope had to have a big field of view. It had to see a lot of the star sky. So you could study lots of stars all at once. And then you could work out what they were made out of. You could work out what their age were. You could work out all of these different things about stars uh, with this telescope. So excuse the physics. This is what it looked like. This is when they did, uh, this is what they, uh, it's called a Baker-Schmidt telescope, for those of you who like this kind of thing. Um, but what it does is it takes light in through a big aperture, puts it through a lens that kind of corrects the light that it comes in, and puts it onto a, a, a primary mirror, which is in our basement, actually. Sorry, I can't show you that, but that mirror is actually in our basement. And then it brings it onto a secondary mirror, which you can see tonight. So the secondary mirror is only about that big. The primary mirror is 90 centimeters and weighs too much for us to carry up from the basement. But it's been down there since 1981. It's not coming up anytime soon. Um, then it goes on to the secondary, which you'll see. And then it goes on to, to a photographic plate holder. And you can see some of the original photographs that were taken with it inside. So they were taken on photographic plates, of course. Nowadays, we all use this to take our photographs. In those days, you took a big piece of glass, exposed it, brought it home, 
<laughs> and that's how you did your science. So that's the way it worked, and it was the biggest telescope in the Southern Hemisphere in 1950. What an achievement for these two new states, North and South, working with the United States to do that very few of us in Ireland know about. I, as a professional astronomy, astronomer, didn't actually know about that 10 years ago, which is actually tragic, <laughs> I have to say. This is what the telescope looked like, and I love the people in this picture. This is, uh, this is the telescope tube, but look who's at this. Uh, this is at Perkin Elmer on the east coast of the United States in 1950. You know, the Irish consul is hanging out with the South African consul, the vice consul, with the British vice consul as well, um, and then people from Harvard looking at this telescope that all these three governments, uh, or, or three entities, were, were involved in. It was installed in Bloemfontein, and that's what it ended up looking at. Here is, um, Actually, I think that's Lindsay. Yeah, it is. That's uh, Eric Lindsay, director of Armagh. And this is uh, Hugh Butler. And some of the photographs that you can see inside were taken by Hugh, Hugh Butler when he was working with, with Lindsay as well. Lindsay trained him on how to use the telescope. And you can see this is a substantial uh, telescope. Um, and here's another picture of it. I love the way they dressed at the time. You know, uh, you, you still had to, had to wear a tie to go to on an observing run um, and, uh, and a jacket. Um, but anyway, there's the telescope working. There was a roof that retracted and they pointed up at the stars and that would track and they would expose cameras. But this led to an awful lot more than that. It led to a lot of collaborative trips. People came from America to visit Armagh, came to visit Dunsink, and we were going back and forth between these uh, entities. So it wasn't just about the telescope, it was the science that was being done with it. So there was this, this is a photograph from the room you're going to go into, where all the agreements are. That was this, that, that room. In fact, lots of those books are still around the observatory. I'm going to take this off. This is too annoying. All right. All right, that's much better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I had no choice on that, obviously. Um, but this is just, it just shows you the collaboration that was going on. The gentleman in the center here is uh, from Harvard, um, and his name was Bach, Bart Bach. Bach is very, very famous. There's a thing called a Bach globule in astronomy. So he's a very famous astronomer visiting uh, Dunsink um, together with um, technicians and so on from, from, from the observatory. I love this uh, visiting student here from St. Patrick's College, who's clearly the priest or the trainee priest in the centre who was learning a little bit of astronomy uh, on his way uh, to wherever. Um, but, and this guy here, the young gentleman, is Peter Brook. In fact, Peter visited us about three weeks ago and uh, told us great stories about living here in 1950. So what did they do? What were they trying to work out? Here are some of the pictures. This is, it's not, it's not the, 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 the highest resolution considering the pictures we see now with the James Webb, but this was a real step forward uh, in, 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 in pictures of, of the Magellanic clouds uh, at the time. And, you know, it ended up on the front cover of Scientific American. So an Irish-American telescope were on the front cover of Scientific American. That was a huge achievement uh, at, at the time. And this was um, uh, an article by Bach, uh, uh, but, you know, uh, the, the, he's talking about this Irish-American telescope. Um, you'll go into the uh, uh, boardroom to see some of these bits and pieces, but please note that and have a look at it from the side, because you'll see the light is bent in a weird way. That's because it's a prism. It's actually, it was the biggest prism built for any telescope in the world at the time, not just Northern Hemisphere or Southern Hemisphere. And that was used to study the spectrum coming from stars. Uh, and you can have a look at that uh, later on. Queen's University paid for that bit. So uh, Armagh and Dunsink and Harvard were paying for the building of it. This bit was, was paid for by Queen's. Don't tell anybody that, though, because uh, they'll probably want it back. Um, but th that was uh, for spectroscopy. And this is just from our visitor book, 1959. The name's in there, Harlow Shapley, uh, and Lindsay is in there as well. But you can see other names, like California, um, San Francisco, uh, uh, Harvard, all coming to talk about astronomy because of this telescope and this man's vision, really, uh, uh, Eamon de Valera. Um, and this is going up into the 1960s now. They're still talking about the data. They're still talking about the astronomy that was going on. Now, the other thing is times were changing in terms of these astronomical images. 
and it led to a real innovation which I think is interesting, and that's computers. This is an article in the Irish Astronomical Journal by Butler and Wayman in 1969, but they got a computer and they were using the computer to, to analyse the data that they got from the Armagh Dunsink Harbour Telescope. And it came from, actually it was a second-hand computer that came from Trinity, but it was in our basement and they were analysing the data from it. And actually I couldn't resist. Look, there's the computer uh, outside Trinity uh, being wrapped up and it was taken out, I think that's Westland Row, and uh, they were taking the computer out and bringing it, uh, bringing it to the observatory. Anyway, that's just an aside. Uh, but there's a, a, a beautiful picture from 1950 then, you know, kind of a, of the time, that Art Deco kind of style, but with Armagh and Dunsink and that great uh, telescope uh, 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 between us, which was on the front of the journal uh, at the time. Now, all of that work didn't go completely to waste. In 1981, they closed it down and started, started doing, uh, stopped doing observations. All the bits and pieces were transported here, and they are still here. But the connection between Ireland and South Africa ha continues, and even today, this telescope here is from UCD. It was built in UCD in the School of Physics uh, by Lorraine Hanlon and her collaborators. And, uh, um, uh, and now there is still an Irish telescope at Boyden Observatory uh, run, run by uh, uh, UCD. So that connection continues on. So that's a brief fly through of a very complicated period and science and technology. And I'd like to invite Mary Daly uh, to the stage now. So Mary uh, is a professor of history, or an adjunct, or retired professor? Yes, uh, well, kind of. Yes. Kind of, kind of. Still working 100 hours a week, I'm sure. Uh, but, uh, and former president of the Royal Irish Academy. And also Michael Burton, if you'd like to come up to the stage as well. Michael Burton is director of Arma Observatory and Planetarium. Welcome to the stage. OK. Maybe, maybe. Maybe Mike, Michael, do you want a microphone? I think well, my voice could carry to 500 students in UCD's. <laughs> <students. laughs> so well, if you want to sit down, and we'll. I, I, think, I think I should be okay. So I get. I, okay. okay. Want my... I guess before, before we start having a chat, um, uh, are there any immediate questions that you'd like to ask me, and then, then we'll, we'll bring, bring others uh, in? Or maybe, maybe Mary, okay, you can. What do you think, and what, what's the historic context of it at the time? Yeah. Uh, I mean, first of all, this is not no, this is not known, and the, there is there's very little. I mean, there, there's a limited amount of stuff on north-south cooperation because there was so little of it anyway. Yeah. Uh, but this bit is not really known, and but it fits perfectly into what we have is the best way to put it. I mean, I was thinking about this this morning, and. If you said there was a Cold War between Stormont and the Dublin government, that would be overestimating the friendship between them, I think, <laughs> really. Because uh, you have, after all, the 1937 Constitution, which did, in fact, in Article 2, claim, claim you know, that the, the territory of the state was the entire island, though for the present, uh, jurisdiction was only being exercised over 26 counties. So you have that. You then have... a. a, a the really, you know, entrenched Ulster Unionism Orange Order, which saw any link, no matter how tenuous, to Dublin as selling out the Union. So you've got two really strongly entrenched groups. The one thing I think we should bear in mind, and it's very important to this general thing, is, is kind of networks of knowledge, uh, professional uh, contacts, and so on like that. Uh, they survived, uh, they survived uh, throughout, throughout the worst years. The Royal Irish Academy, which we've mentioned, was, all, was and remains an all Ireland academy. The Royal Colleges of Physicians, those kind of organisations. Uh, the historians got together and set up an organisation to cover history with parity of esteem north and south in the 1930s, which not the uh, coziest decade, but and that survived. So you'd find that professional circles knew each other and those connections were quite important. Um, I mean, the area for the first... If I could just say something there about the professional organisations, there was a body called the Irish Astronomical Society, which was founded, um, I think, in the 19... About this time, about actually. About this time, and, yeah. Uh, and it set up a it was, and, and, and it was, yeah, it was, but there was Belfast and Dublin, and but even in the 1970s, you know, that, that continued on. Absolutely. And there was and there was a professional and an amateur was, yeah. aspect Absol to it as well, and, and it just kept going. Absolutely. She, she named dropping... When I met Prince Charles, then Prince Charles last year, he wanted to. Who? He met 
he, he, he wanted to talk to a small group of historians about, about commemoration, and he was saying it must be very difficult. And I did explain to him, well, the historians on the island who work on Ireland have been collaborating since the 1930s, and we did it throughout all the troubles, we all traveled north, up and down, saw each other, and this, you know. So I think professional links should not be underestimated, and they are very much part of the story, I think, as well. I mean, the crowd where the connection started, uh, it tried to be started government to government, was actually electricity, which, of course, is a new okay. concept at the time. The SB had surplus uh, capacity on the Shannon uh, scheme, surprise, surprise. Uh, Northern Ireland was vulnerable. They had primarily a, a power station in, in the harbour, in Belfast Harbour. And uh, the two, Northern Ireland Electricity Board and the SP, started talking about an interconnector in the early 30s. Uh, nothing happened. I mean, you know, uh, there's no way the Stormont government would have lived with this kind of appalling idea. But then in the 1940s, as a, we, we were neutral, Northern Ireland was part of the Allied effort. Belfast was bombed. Lord Beaverbrook, who was in charge of a lot of the military production, he, a cabinet minister in Churchill's government, more or less told the Northern Ireland government to be sensible and to come to an agreement with, with the ESB in terms of some kind of an interconnector. Mm. And what nobody knows is there was actually a north-south interconnector built, which a, 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 between roughly Beth, a, a Dundalk and Newry, a, a, which was a, completed in 1942. A, it was never mentioned by anybody. It was top, top secret. The ESB built a bit as far as the board of the Northern Ireland Electricity Board went this far. And what the Northern what the Stormont government said, this is not political, this is purely business, and there will be no no rec no ministerial fingerprints anywhere on it, no photo opportunities. Uh, and even the civil service, you know, kept kept good two arms length mm. from it. It was, it was electricians, it was uh, engineers to engineers, and the All-Ireland Electrical Engineering Society was actually a it, an it, important It's interesting con because the, uh, the Irish Power Grid nowadays is still owned by Airgrid. Yeah. Airgrid mm. still owns the Northern Irish I know, Power I, Grid, I believe. Well, yeah, but that, that, that's relatively recent. Yeah. But, and then the next level of that was, was, was the EARN scheme, and I'm kind of sorry you carry yeah, as a good Donegal woman isn't here, because the ESB had wanted to do a, a hydro station on the River Earn. The River Earn, it, it, the uh, and Loch Erin is, of course, in County Fermanagh, but it then drops sharply down towards the sea near Ballyshannon, and there's the Cliff Falls and the Kathleen Falls, and they were they were much easier, in fact, in terms of electricity generation than the Shannon. It required much less, you know, engineering to get it done, mm. and they wanted to do it, and they started talking <coughs> to the Northern Ireland Electricity <coughs> Board about it in the early 1930s. This conversation started, uh, and it was really getting nowhere. Meanwhile, Fermanagh land was flooded all the time because the urn needed draining and dredging and nothing was happening. Any sense of an agreement with the Dublin government was absolutely anathema. Uh, but then Basil Brook, Lord Bookborough, later Lord Brookborough, for man a landowner, becomes uh, the Prime Minister and he has to put up with the wrath of the Ulster Farmers Union for Manna Branch and his constituents whose land is all flooded. Would he please do something about it? My, and my grandfather as well. Okay. <laughs> Okay. From that part of the world, okay. they well, were farmers in yeah, Vermont. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, so Brookborough decided actually this was not such a bad idea. And the Dublin government had already decided that they were going to go. They had already ESB had done the planning for the Erin scheme. It was going to cost two and a half million, which was a lot of money in those days. Drainage uh, to make it work in Northern Ireland would come to almost half a million, but the Dublin government would pay for all of this. Uh, and the question is, how are you going to get this agreement through? And I mean, the statements are quite extraordinary. The whole thing is, it is not political. There cannot be any ministerial contact. It must be done, ESB to NIEB. It must be done at quite, a, quite an arm's length. Uh, and, and 
it takes him several years to get it through his cabinet because they're all saying, no, this is kind of creeping irredentism and, and all the rest so, of it. So do you think that the government, is that what you're suggesting, that the two governments worked out a way of working that didn't involve well, this, the government? This, this, is, this is the they, point they, I'm they, coming to. The Harvard, oh, okay. your, your agreement fits exactly into the ah, template yeah. into the template that comes up. Uh, you will never get a, a politician's signature on it. You will never get a meeting between them. They will never show up at anything like that. Even the top civil servant in, in Northern Ireland tended to send a deputy to deal with. Uh, and he got it through. It was about, I mean, Dublin had agreed it. What, uh, what Northern Ireland didn't realise, probably fortuitously, that Dublin said w they wouldn't go ahead with it if the Northern Ireland government didn't, didn't uh, acquiesce in it. Northern Ireland was terrified that the Dublin government would put the hydro scheme in place and might mess up the drainage even further in Northern Ireland if they didn't agree to it. Um, so... They start going ahead with the agreement, at which point, and this is why this is interesting, and there's another twist to it, the Attorney General in Northern Ireland says, hang on a moment, your jurisdiction only runs within the, within the area of Northern Ireland. You cannot sign anything that, is, that relates to distant Ballyshannon, you know, kind of walking distance from the border. This is not possible. This would be unconstitutional. And uh, he may have been trying to block the whole scheme. So at this point, they have to go to Westminster. And in the summer of 1947, it's after the agreement was signed, and a, a, the, a, the Westminster Parliament passes a piece of Miscellaneous Provisions Act to enable the government of Northern Ireland to enter into agreements that may have implications and something or other. I mean, they're not even spending money in this electricity agreement beyond, beyond the jurisdiction of the state. Okay. So they have to put in an agreement that the, the, uh, the Kathleen Falls and the Cliff Falls, the sluices, they had a gentleman's agreement on it pre this, but gentleman's agreements when you're building a major investment is a bit is, is not exactly the way to go. Mm. So they got, they, they, it was agreed that the Office of Public Works here and the Board of Works, which was part of, I think, the Ministry of Finance in Northern Ireland, could 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 w could regulate it between the two of them, I, I, and they do that. So this kind of goes through gradually, and that is the first really major agreement, big agreement between the two. Okay. It's very interesting. Almost nothing was said about it in Stormont. I mean. The cabinet are at loggerheads over it all the time. And when people, there was a lot more said about it in the Dáil, the legislation went through, and people would ask De Valera or some of the other ministers, are you talking to the government of Northern Ireland about that? And De Valera would give kind of mumbled replies about the, the work contacts. And any minute, and, and you know, in other words, minimal, minimal information given about what the nature of those contacts were. Uh, because really, you know, they, they were aware that this could blow it, the scheme out, you know, this could, this could, it, scupper the scheme in terms of sensibilities in Northern Ireland. So what I find interesting is that this, uh, which was signed a few months before the final signing on the urn scheme, it's exactly the same formula. You've got their Arma Observatory and its, you know, trust board, a governor of whatever it is, and the dais and its governor. Both governments know jolly well what's happening, but their fingerprints are not anywhere on the documentation. Mm -hmm. And the same with the uh, with the urn scheme. It's ESB to, D to NIEB. Again, no ministerial presence anywhere. They have worked out a way of getting around it, justifying it in terms of pragmatism and need. Now, pragmatism in this case, I don't necessarily think applies. It's, it's, it's much more ambitious than that. Uh, the other point I would make, just to echo what you said, uh, I do think uh, Lindsay is the real hero of this. And, a devil, and with the, if De Valera had been out, if he didn't get it through, as I was saying to you earlier, in the autumn of 47, De Valera is out of office by uh, February 48, and that government would just have torn the whole thing up. There's no doubt about mm. it. What I would like to read to you, I mean, I just want to, do, to, make, to read a couple of things, about, uh, just a couple of other points. First of all, Dev saw Dunsink as a bridge between UCD and Trinity, which he was keen to achieve because he, he'd kind of taken classes in both as a, as a student yes. and, and he was very much behind that. The, but the other thing I want, to, I want to point out is Lindsay, an art, a, a superb politician, you know, and a superb scientist, writing to De Valera in 1942, he said... He, he wrote of the part which astronomy could play in the life of the community. Only an observatory could be the rallying point for all in Ireland. In other words, he sees the observatory very much in an all-island uh, mm. focus at the time. 
1945, and this is before, before the meeting with, with, with Shapley, actually, in 1945, Lindsay sends Devlin a copy of the draft mem memorandum that he had prepared for the government of Northern Ireland, setting out the needs for Armagh Observatory in the post-war years. It's the only file, eh, and it, it's in the National Archives. I really should have taken a picture of it. Eh, and it's marked top secret and confidential, personal and confidential in red. It's the only file, Northern Ireland government file, that I've found in, in the Irish National Archives, you know, and uh, I think not many people are, are aware of it Very there, if, which is interesting. I mean, Dev's interest in this place was quite remarkable. There's a memo, as I was telling you. Just, it, just before you move on from that point, um, uh, the gen gentleman who's going right at the very back of the room there, he, he's the Lindsay's scholar. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. So we continue that, but Lindsay's son then became director of this observatory. Oh, did he? Oh, that's yeah, wonderful. So, so, I didn't know a, that. There was uh, a, a, a father. Uh, Ellison, you think about like, you're getting the... Ellison. Oh, 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 sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes, 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 Ellison, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but we, we can come back to yeah, Ellison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But, but Dev's personal interest <laughs> in, in this place is quite clear. The file in the National Archives dated December 48. There's very little in the archives. And a civil servant, it's a typical civil service file, and it's noting the former teacher, that's De Valera, had taken a special interest in the details about Dunsink, and he particularly wanted to know what property was Trinity holding on to when the when Dunsink was transferred? Okay. And he wanted to know what were the terms of the lease to the dais. But the, the civil servant note, as the present Taoiseach is most unlikely to take any interest in these particular matters, uh, we need not pursue them and the file may be put away. It had to be taken out again in 51 when Devler comes into office. Okay, good. So, I do think astronomy was also important. I mean, you, you showed the International Union and so on, because Ireland in the 1950s was very, very isolated. It was very isolated in a Cold War world because it, it had declined to join NATO and it hadn't been, it was neutral in World War II, so it wasn't in the United Nations. So it didn't belong to that many international organisations. And I think astronomy was one that it could belong to. And then, then the final point is that Lindsay himself gets interested in the Dunsink link because he, he sees at the Royal Society the planning for for, uh, for astronomy in post-war Britain, and he realizes that in the UK, Armagh is going to be really a small player in, in, in the wider UK scene. Whereas if he can kind of establish its Irishness, it becomes a much more significant player. Mm -hmm. And I think I wouldn't ignore that. It's not a political point, but he's aware of it. In other words, that, that placing it in an all Ireland context gives it a much greater significance. Interesting. So, sorry, that, that's really what I want to say. Very but but that, is, that, is, that follows the template that they've worked out how to do business with the enemy without being contaminated <laughs> by... Very good. All right, we mightn't use the word enemy in no, the future. No, no, speaking, no, speaking, no, speaking, no, no, speaking no, of no, friends the north of the border. Oh, of course, well. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I thought that... Um, so Michael, is the, Michael Burton is the director of Armagh um, uh, Observatory and Planetarium, mm -hmm. which it is now known known as and uh, I, I thought I'd invite Michael to say something maybe about a little bit more about the telescope itself and the science that it was or that was done with with the telescope maybe you'd like to say or maybe even comment on some actually, of the maybe I'll comment a couple of things first because we'll yeah. yeah. actually perhaps have this worth commenting also about the state of Irish astronomy per se in the early part of the 20th century and the effect Lindsay had on that and the way of transforming it ultimately to the um, the, uh, the community we have today, which is a very lively and, and, and vibrant one, but it really did change. So perhaps actually jumping back even earlier, in the middle of the 19th century, Ireland sort of led the way internationally in astronomy with Amar, Burr, and Dunsink in particular, and, and, and the contributions that they made, uh, which is a whole story in itself, which we won't get into today. But unfortunately, by the early part of the 20th century, that had, that had fallen apart. And in particular, the time of partition, I mean, we heard the story that, uh, that essentially Dunsink closed. I mean, there was essentially no funding at all in the, in the southern government. In the northern government, perhaps things weren't great by any means, but in fact, it was actually trying to show that they were a real country in some sense. It actually yeah. kept Armagh yeah. going. The northern government actually yeah. put yeah. some money in. It wasn't a huge amount of money, but it was enough to keep it alive. It actually was, it was kept on hand and, hand and mouth. And in fact, it was actually, there was an Ellison, William Ellison, whose son, Mervyn, actually became the, um, the, the director here later. But William Ellison was the director of Armagh and if, from about 1918 for about uh, 18 years, 18, 17 years. And he, I guess he kept it afloat, but he wasn't really able to do that much with it. He didn't really have the sources the source and the funds. And it was Lindsay's coming here 
Well, Lindsay is from Portadown originally. I don't know quite how it happened, but somehow he managed to go to the States and do a PhD in Harvard. In fact, I'd love to find out how he managed to get the contacts to get out there and do it. With, with, perhaps you haven't explained it. Harlow Shapley is one of the leading astronomers of the 20th century. If you ask any astronomer around who's a famous person about De Valero and Shapley, and, and they will say Shapley. And Chapley basically the size of the universe debate and our concept of where we are in the universe. Chapley was a major player in that. But somehow, um, Lindsay got out there, was supervised by this great astronomer, and came back in, 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 in 37 when the position uh, opened up in Armagh. And he essentially then had a vision to start, uh, basically transform, transform, and actually basically, or in some sense, create astronomy in Ireland. He was, at the time, he was the only paid astronomer on this island. It's hard to believe that in 1937, uh, <laughs> what we have today. I mean, we might say we have, we're struggling today, but compared with what times were like then, there's absolutely nothing like that. And he had a series of, of, of things. I mean, one of them is he started the astronomy department at Queen's, which I know you went yeah. to, for instance. Yeah. He started, that was one of the very, very early things that came in. But the, the Amar Dunsink Harvard, I mean, that was the, I guess the genesis of that idea came from discussions he would have had with, of course, with, with, with Shapley. And, and Shapley had the great fortune to be in, in Shannon Airport at this critical time. And being a, I think being a brash American, he'd had no trouble walking up to the, uh, <laughs> the, the tea shop or the prime minister and introducing himself. I don't think I would have had the guts to do that if I was in yeah. that situation. But he, he introduced, and, and as I say, the rest is, the rest is history, and, and, and this project uh, came out of that. And Lindsay had spent time in Boyden as an assistant. And he had, in fact, he actually had, he knew South Africa uh, as well. That was the other so part I, th of it, I yes. think between. But I think he was the uh, acting director at. Boyden, when the job in Armagh came up or something like that, there was, he, I think he was there at the time. Yeah, but it, it must have been incredible at the time to go observing. Yes. At the moment, we hop on a plane or uh, and go somewhere. Yeah. But they would have taken a ship down uh, observing and then they would spend months on end, maybe a year, yes. and, and then come back again with all of their photographic plates. So it was an expedition yes. <laughs> at the time. But, and, and maybe you'd like to say something about the telescope well, and then what it was used say, yes. for. Well, let's talk which about it was an more interesting more. story as well. So, have you been to? Actually, I've never actually been to South. I have to admit, I have not actually been to South. Even though I'm a Southern Hemisphere person, mm. but my roots are Australian, in fact. But mm. I can use that to explain why I go to the Southern Hemisphere. But, mm. but. Um, so yes, let's talk about why would you want to take it? Why would you, why would you not build an island? Well, obviously we, we know about the weather here, but there are <laughs> other places in Europe which are not so bad for astronomy. But in fact. You're missing, well, first of all, you're missing half the sky. Mm. But not just missing half the sky, you're missing the best part of the sky. Yeah. And if you've ever been fortunate enough to go to the Southern Hemisphere on a dark night and you see the spectacle of the Milky Way running overhead, you realize that even on the greatest night we have here, we, 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 we don't get that great spectacle. I mean, the Milky Way literally runs overhead. The center of our galaxy, in fact, goes directly overhead if you're at the right latitude of, say, Sydney or, or Cape Town or, or Santiago. Uh, and so you do see it running right across the sky. Midwinter is when it's, when it's, it's best, when the, the nights are longest over there. But it's not just the galaxy. There's the neighboring galaxies, and these are the Magellanic Clouds, which um, are their satellite galaxies of our own, but they're galaxies in their own right. Uh, and they allow you to start studying what, what a galaxy looks like as opposed to See, within our own galaxy, it's actually quite hard to study the galaxy because you can't actually see its proper structure. And in fact, there's all sorts of things in our galaxy that get in the way. There's things, dark clouds. In fact, you heard Bok globules. We mentioned that earlier on. Well, Bok globules are basically clouds of gas and dust which block our view. So we actually don't see a very good view of our own galaxy from within it. But when we see other galaxies, we can start to probe. And these are the two nearest other galaxies. And so they were very important for starting to expand our conception of, of, of the universe. And in fact, one of the key things in there is that one of, the, one, of the, one of the prime things they were trying to study with this telescope was something called a Cepheid variable. Should I move on to that? Now, yes. Absolutely. Uh, so ahead, a Cepheid yeah. variable is a particular, particularly luminous kind of star. It's a star which actually pulsates. In other words, it gets brighter and fainter, brighter and fainter. Mm -hmm. Now, these have been discovered in, I guess, the late part of the 19th century. And it was actually Henrietta Leavitt. There's actually a story that goes back to Harvard here, too. But I, I, <laughs> I won't get into all the stories in astronomy in, in one particular go. But um, the, 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 there was realizing the pulsation, actually, that the, 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 the time scale for the pulsation was actually related to the total luminosity of the star. And what, why that was important was that if you know the luminosity, the actual, the actual absolute brightness, you could work out how far away it was. In other words, it's a way of measuring distance. 
Now, it turns out it's a bit more complicated than that. It turns out there's more than one type of Cepheid and other sorts of complications. But using the imaginary clouds, which is a, a galaxy where technically everything is roughly the same distance, you could start to explore and understand what's going on. So it was really important to have uh, an object uh, which we, we could study where we could start to do the, 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 the messy stuff of the science, because the science is always much messier and trickier than, than the, 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 the global story I was telling there. And this telescope, indeed, was uh, used to study that. But if you go and see some of the photographic plates, uh, which are out there, a couple of them are labeled Cepheid Project. And that's exactly what they were. They were for looking for these Cepheid variables and measuring their luminosities and basically getting their distances. Yeah, so they call them standard candles, uh, these kind of things. So if you can see the pulsation, you just get a distance. It's a very easy way of working out a distance to, a, uh, to an object. And, and I guess this telescope was doing it. There's a bit of a tragedy, really, though, with this telescope. Of course, it couldn't be an Irish story without some tragedy uh, to it. But the telescope itself, and Michael was mentioning this to me, is the way it was stored. Do you well, want to say fact, something about that? Uh, actually, what your, one of your previous, actually, this one sort of shows it here. I think one of the previous pictures is even more so than that. But I think we can describe it here. <laughs> It's, 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 I mean, first of all, you've got to, to, you've got to protect your telescope. You, and normally we have them in a nice big dome, as you see the domes outside here, or the, 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 the yeah, grub, yeah. The, the south dome. But this one had this kind of tin shed, which was, sounds very convenient, but so that tin shed, basically, I think the roof's just moved across. But as you can see, the telescope sticks out above it. So actually, what you had to do was tilt the telescope over. That sounds fair enough, tilt the telescope over, move the shed across. But the problem is, the, uh, the, the lens over there, and in fact the mirror at the bottom, um, is how they're supported. Uh, and normally in a mirror, you, you, you actually generally hold it so the weight of the mirror is, is, is held underneath. But you tilt it up like that, and essentially all the weight is on one side, and, and similarly the, the, the lens, at the, the correcting lens at the top, all the weight's on one side. So over time, essentially, it was deforming under, the, under its own weight. And that ultimately led to the fact that the quality of the images was not as good as it should be. So mm. uh, in retrospect, so this is obvious they could have done that. But I think in the, in the day, first of all, people didn't, weren't really so aware of what telescopes could actually do. But secondly, I don't think there was the money to actually build the, a, a proper facility. So they had to cobble it together, and they did the best they could. And there was a few things that the mount itself, that's another story, wasn't the best of mount. But the building it was put in was probably just the, well, sort of all they could afford to, afford and, to put and up. The, the, the glass um, entrance at the very top there is called the objective prism and you can see that in the room inside so that, that that's actually the piece that's in the fireplace uh, is, is actually the objective prism from 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 the telescope um, there was a the, the, the this story came to a really tragic end though at the end because they took it and placed it on the back of a flatbed truck and as they were driving it away from the site uh, it slid off the side of the uh, uh, and rolled down a hill so the poor telescope ended up in, in uh, on the side of a road in Africa um, anyway it was then brought uh, 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 back up onto the truck, uh, disassembled, put in a boat and brought to Dunsink Observatory where it is now. And now we celebrate it. And we celebrate all of the work that it has done over those years. And um, it's clearly a story of, you know, ambition from the, the, the Taoiseach at the time. You know, huge ambition to put Ireland in, in, uh, in its place internationally. Um, but also one of great political maneuvering to use these kind of agreements to get it across the line and convince the Doyle that this was a good thing to do, but then come up with a, a framework by which it could be done between the institutes. And then also, you know, then to the collaboration, I think is so key. It's us co having conversations that really leads to new ideas uh, that we do new astronomy by. And those collaborations continue on uh, to this day with telescopes like the Low Frequency Array radio telescope that we have down in Burr. Um, we built that between Armagh and ourselves and other Irish institutions through, through this kind of cooperation uh, with support from governments north and south. I always remember um, on, in the North-South Executive, uh, I think it was Martin McGuinness mentioned the word LOFAR radio telescope uh, as a way for North-South cooperation to continue on. So it, it's, it's, it's something that I hope will continue on between us uh, for many, many years did, to come. Did any of the Dias people who went to 
South Africa? Because the, the original plan was they'd go and spend four months in the year there. Did okay. they keep diaries or letters? Or, I mean, just interesting to know, you know, yeah. is there any record of their time there? It'd be worth checking if anything could be dredged up because... I don't know, Matthew, yeah. Michael, or Ma Matthew McMahon so here. Just introduce Matthew. He's well, going to be do, standing yeah. out in the, uh, afterwards so you can actually see... Uh, um, Explain the telescope. But Matthew's actually just started his PhD today in in, the, in history yeah. of astronomy and, and and so on. But Matthew interviewed someone called John Butler, who actually is retired. Uh, he worked at both Dunsink and Armagh, and yeah. he worked with this telescope. So you, you you you've got some reports of what what he what he did, didn't you? So we're not we're not really looking at the 1960s and that history. The other his correspondence internationally with South Africa. So we do actually hold about um, five to six thousand various bits of paper coming from our members and coming from Boeing and from the actual community. And a lot of the people were in the next day they actually came back to our map. Mm -hmm. One of the other really good records we have is that Dave Andrews, another our uh, astronomer, actually did actually have home video in the nature of in Dunsink as well, actually showing the telescope in action, and as well as just local Yes. I mean, for instance, I know, for instance, there are stories, particularly with uh, well, John Butler, who's retired now, who would go out there for a few months and come back. But in fact, it turns out that sometimes he didn't quite get the permission from the director about going out there. And there's some articles, there's some letters in the archives from the archbishop, who's, who's still the chair of the board of governors, sort of chiding this person for not getting permission. To, I think that's one of the times he came back and he didn't get permission. He didn't put to, in his travel, <laughs> put in his travel <laughs> request properly for coming back all the way. And he, and he yeah. went to visit some other places on the way back. So yes, all yeah. these yeah. human yeah. interest <laughs> type yeah. stories about your... The, the uh, cameraman <laughs> at the back of the room is off to uh, uh, a, a meeting soon. I, get, I gave him his travel permission today, yes, but, but he, he did remind he me reminded twice, us. and twice, uh, he yes. has travel permission to go yes, to Croatia sir. for a, a space <laughs> weather meeting, and so he will be in reimbursed when he comes back. But maybe we can open uh, this to the floor, that, uh, and uh, if anybody have any comments or questions or, mm. or stories that they'd like to, to, to share with everybody? So, any questions? Mm. Yes? Um, you didn't discuss the part that Harvard played in the tripart arrangement. Yeah. I mean, obviously, or is it obvious that they contributed the bulk yeah. of the money yeah. and equipment for the project? Yeah. 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 The, 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 yeah, uh, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, maybe I didn't give enough credit to Harvard on this. It was their observatory. Uh, uh, Boyden Observatory was, was, was their, their observatory. Uh, and also um, the Northern Irish and Southern Irish governments contributed 5,000 5, pounds. 5,000, wasn't it? Yes. Correct. Uh, yeah. 5,000 yeah, pounds yeah. in total totally. between them. I thought no, it was 5,000 no, five, 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 five each. But yeah. wasn't was it 13,000 was Harvard or something? It yeah, was, it was yeah, that yeah, kind of, yes. Right, it was, that, it was that, more that, than that, the sum of the two that, 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 Irish that, governments that, together. That's yes. significantly <laughs> more. Um, <laughs> what, what they did, so, so, but they provided the site and then they provided free accommodation for the visiting astronomers. That was part of the agreement that there would be accommodation provided yes. for, for, mm -hmm. for them. Um, the, what it did run into trouble with is that there's, uh, the, the optics were all spherical optics and so the photographic plates had to be spherical and they were spherical glass plates, they were really expensive. So every exposure you took was costly. And you know, this is an experimental science, so you get it wrong 10 times and you might get it right, right once. And so that was prohibitive. Um, they then went to the square plates and they became cheaper. Uh, the entire archive is still held in Harvard and they're digitizing it at the moment, actually. They're going through, so I, I was in contact with Harvard around this event. Uh, and they were telling me that they are digitizing everything, so they will all be available online uh, and freely available. But that, that's in addition to, to your comments. So they're still contributing in some way to, to ABH. But yeah, certainly the, the lion's share of the finances came from the Harvard side, as you probably would, would yes. expect. <laughs> and and look, yeah, their endowment was probably bigger than the uh, gross product of, of Ireland at the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, any other questions? Yeah. Was there much analysis? They were, yeah, so the question was, uh, just in case other people didn't hear at the back there, was just when the plates came 
back, you know, how did they analyze them or where were they analyzed? Well, they, the, the plates were brought back and you'd put them onto a machine that then allowed you to work out how bright different things were as you went across your image. And we actually have one of the machines in the basement falling apart, but there is one of those machines that were used. Uh, likewise, sets of the plates went to Harvard where they would photometrically analyze the plates and, and similarly in Dunsink. It's funny, you mentioned uh, uh, John Butler, who, who was a student here or a researcher here and then went to Armagh, but he came back here for the first time in 30 years recently with a box of plates oh, that he had borrowed from here. <laughs> and he gave them back to me after 30 years. Um, so yeah, that, that was the way the analysis was done, but it was also, so thank you very much for coming along and thank you to our panel members. Thank you. Enjoy. Good. 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 Okay. Okay.